everyone. Um, thanks for joining um, the India Stack for Financial Inclusion webinar. We will get started in just a second. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we are so looking forward to discussing India Stack for Financial Inclusion today. We have Mona Kapoor on the line. She is our Director of Digital Solutions India here at Axiom. But before we turn to her, I just have a couple of housekeeping items to discuss to make sure that we are all using the best time, um, best use of our time here together and that everyone can actively participate in the discussion. Right now, everybody is muted so that we can avoid background noise during the presentation. Um, you will see on the screen now a screenshot of the menu that you should be seeing on the right hand side of your screen. So right here it is blown up so that it's much easier to see, but you can see that there are a couple of functions that we just want to point out. Um, so there are two ways to ask questions. The first is the hand question or the hand function, and you can click on this to indicate that you are raising your hand. Feel free to click on this if you have a question or a comment, and then we will call on you at the end of the presentation. Um, however, we would also like to encourage you to use the question box for your questions. You can type a question in this box and we will be sure to relay the question to Mona at the end of the webinar. Hopefully that is clear, but if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into that chat box or to raise your hand. Um, so before we get started today, we'd like to put the poll up on a screen to get a better idea of who we are talking to today. We are interested in knowing why you are interested in India Stack and what brought you here today. So as you'll see on the screen, there are a couple of options. Um, the first is greater operational efficiency at my institution, improve customer satisfaction at my institution, interested in learning from India's experience, just a general interest in the topic, and other. Uh, we realize that these options may not be completely inclusive, so feel free to choose the option that best represents you and feel free to select other if you do not see any option that is most applicable to you. Great, okay, so it looks like we have the majority of the people on the line that are interested in learning from India's experience um, and general interest in the topic. So that's great, it looks like there's you know, fewer practitioners on the line, but more people that are interested in learning on about what is going on in India. Perfect. Okay, so for anyone that's just joined, I just wanted to reiterate that on the right side of your screen, you should see two options to ask questions. You can either raise your hand by clicking on the hand symbol, or you can use the, um, the question field to ask any questions. Um, and we will be addressing all questions at the end of the webinar. And also, you'll see on the right hand side that you can download the deck in a PDF form, so that is available to you right now. Um, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Priya Punathar, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I would like to now introduce Shweta Pereira, the Program Manager for Axion's Global Advisory Solutions in India. I will now turn it over to her to introduce today's topic and our speaker today, Mona Kapoor. Thank you, Priya. Uh, great to be here and very exciting to be part of this Financial Inclusion Week and this very important topic on the India stack. Well, Financial Inclusion Week is a week of global conversations, uh, virtual and some in person, on the most important steps to advance financial inclusion. It is an opportunity for different stakeholders like ourselves, practitioners, researchers, policymakers, maybe donors, to step back and discuss how we can make a quantum leap to meet our customers' needs. The Financial Inclusion Week is going on. Uh, it's from October 30th to November 3rd, uh, where stakeholders are exploring how new products and partnerships are empowering customers. So where does India Stack actually fit in all this? Today, we will be talking about how India Stack, a digital infrastructure that is bringing paperless, cashless services to anyone with access to a smartphone, tablet, or computer and is bringing millions of Indians into the formal economy by breaking down the barriers that has kept them out. This research and thinking was possible through the generosity of City Foundation. So that's, that's a brief introduction about our topic. Uh, now going on to uh, who is Mona Kapoor, our, our main speaker here at the webinar today. Today we will be hearing from Mona Kapoor, Director of Digital Solutions India, 
Mona is based in Mumbai and works with teams across Axion to implement digital solution projects in the country. Uh, Mona brings more than 15 years of experience in product development, sales, and marketing in the payments, banking, and service industry. Mona joins us from NPCI, the National Payments Corporation of India, where she was instrumental in the concept, design, and implementation of Rupee, India's own card scheme, and the linked insurance program. This initiative is a key part of India's Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, PMJDY scheme, which today is the world's largest financial inclusion program. So very well fit to talk about this topic of India Stack. So over to you, Mona. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you, Priya. Um, I welcome uh, everybody uh, for this webinar today and will briefly run you through the agenda before we proceed on with the presentation. As a part of the agenda, we'll have an overview of the evolution of digital payments in India, an introduction to the India stack, its benefits, risks, and mitigations. Uh, further on into the presentation, we will also present to you a case study on EKYC and UPI each, where we will demonstrate to you how NBFCs can leverage India stack for financial inclusion. The evolution of in, uh, digital payments in India essentially uh, can be dated to start in 2008 with the setup of National Payments Corporation of India as a organization, an umbrella organization to facilitate retail payment transactions in the country. Uh, and also the setup of UIDAI in 2009. And since then, the country has only surged forward with the uh, with the long, uh, with the instation of Aadhaar, the launch of Rupee, the uh, implementation of EKYC uh, for validation of customers uh, uh, on, on a real-time basis using just their biometric uh, information, the launch of uh, PMJDY, the world's largest financial inclusion program, and today where we are at uh, uh, at uh, at a point where India is transforming from a, a, a cash intensive and a paper based economy to a less cash and a less paper usage uh, economy with the launch of path baking products such as UPI, the Beam app and Bharat QR. So what is India Stack? India Stack is a set of APIs which allows governments businesses to essentially utilize this digital infrastructure to actually transition into that environment of being paperless and cashless. The five basic components or tenants of India stack are Aadhaar, which is the code premise, uh, EKYC, where telcos, banks, and entities essentially onboarding customers to provide services to them where they need to essentially authenticate who the customer is, can digitize the KYC process and thus go paperless. UPI, uh, which is the unified payment interface where in an interoperable environment, money can be transferred between bank accounts in an instant and a secure manner. DigiLocker to retrieve, store, and share digital documents, um, uh, which are verified. Uh, E-Sign to sign a document electronically using Aadhaar. So these are essentially the five components of India stack. The APIs of these components reside with uh, different entities. Um, for example, EKYC decides with the UIDAI, UPI decides with the uh, National Payments Corporation of India, and DigiLocker and eSign with uh, the uh, METI, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology Government of India. We will look at the value proposition of each of these components uh, of India stack. On your left hand side on the screen, you see the customer perspective. On the top panel is what you see is the FSP or the NBFC's perspective, while uh, the, the main portion of the slide covers the core value proposition. So Aadhaar, the core value proposition for Aadhaar is that it can be leveraged as a tool for establishing trust and thereby accountability. From a customer's perspective, it is something that's unique, belongs to him, and all his benefits are actually linked to this single number. From an FSP's perspective, or it essentially means is that you're able to identify a customer through this identity, and you are able to connect with Aadhaar online for fetching and validating this information of the customer. 
EKYC for a customer essentially means hassle-free uh, onboarding with a service provider, no physical documentation and thus saving him a lot of time, effort and money. From a FSP's perspective, it essentially means that you can now do your KYC procedure for the customer in an efficient, real-time and a cost-effective manner. These uh, information thus fetched from UIDI can now stored in a, a reliable uh, manner on your uh, on your systems and you also don't need to now physically store these documents and send them for warehousing or for future reference upi which is the buzzword today in the country essentially for a customer means mobile interoperable instant payments on the go for an fsp it essentially creates a very strong uh, business case to collect payments fees and charges electronically it also means a lower cost of operations giving them a scalable model which uh, within uh, speed efficiency and uh, ensuring that uh, over a period of time they can bring down customer defaults by being proactive in reaching out and sending out reminders to their customer base E-sign for a customer gives him the power to digitally execute contracts and agreement, thereby giving him protection from forgery. From an FSP's perspective, it, it essentially helps them digitally execute contracts and agreements and also provides them immunity from false uh, contracts or from host clients. DigiLocker, uh, one of the final components of India Stack, essentially empowers a customer to digitally store his documents it gives him the freedom from hassles of lost documents and also the customer now can control whom to provide access to his digilocker thereby sharing his documents from an fsp's perspective they can push these certificates contracts or agreements digitally into the digilocker of the customer and uh, on the other side, if there is additional documentation that they seek from the from the customer, they can get a, a defined access to the customer's DigiLocker to access these documents. Well, what are the kind of risks that we can feel exposed to in in a digital and an electron electronified environment? Simply put, the risks are there; they cannot be eliminated but they can be mitigated. What you see here on the screen is a lot of information which has probably been released in the press and there's more to it. However, can all the risks be eliminated? Is there potential for a big fraud? Or uh, are we sure that we have enough to share with the customer in terms of security of their data, their information? Well, the simple answer to this from most risk experts globally is that we have to be very methodical in our approach towards risk mitigation. Our, we need to have sound processes. We need to ensure that uh, there is uh, integrity within our systems and our processes, stay ahead of fraudsters and ensure that all the um, upgrades to the APIs and to the integrations within these APIs are done in a timely manner to prevent any kind of information or data breach. The numbers from India stack essentially mean that the rapid uptake ensures that as NBFCs, you cannot ignore uh, India stack. So far, Aadhaar has seen 1,186 million enrollments with UPI having 55 banks already certified and the October data indicated 76 million transactions totaling to over 7,000 crores INR. DigiLocker 2 has about uh, 8.5 uh, million registered users with over 34 organizations already issuing documents into the DigiLocker. The EKYC, uh, which has been done leveraging the Aadhaar infrastructure, the number of transactions stand at 3,423 million. Now, these are staggering numbers. These numbers indicate a, a rapid uptake within the country. 
and it is also an indication that banks and MFIs, NBFCs, etc., cannot really choose to ignore India's stack and its components. We will now move on to the case studies. So uh, the case study on EKYC essentially here is moving from a paper-based, uh, paper-intensive, and a logistic-intensive process onto a fast, secure, and a reliable EKYC. Organization which is in consideration is an NBFC, which is dispensing MSME loans to its customers. And they considered EKYC to address a business problem, which is time consuming and paper intensive customer onboarding. They looked at EKYC to address this problem and to make their internal processes more efficient. So the considerations for a go no go decision for them were basis a technical capability enhancement to capture the Aadhaar number within their systems, uh, which is essentially the loan management system. Deployment of field devices to start doing the account opening in a digital manner and to then add in the biometric devices and have a integration with Aadhaar uh, for EKYC. The commercial aspects in this assessment were essentially the capital and the operating expenditures that would be uh, required to support the ongoing operations uh, for EKYC. And all this in respect to the current and projected loan customers of the NBFC. We already know that a number of leading banks and telco providers in the country have already adopted the EKYC route. Axion helped this NBFC to make an assessment to, to reach a go no go decision for implementing EKYC in the current scenario of their business. So before we move on to what was the eventual decision for this uh, particular company, let us look at what are the cost considerations in EKYC. As we understand today, there is a production license access fee payable to UIDI, which is INR 20 lakhs, which is approximately 30,000 US dollars, which is a license access for a period of two years. For a testing environment or to test the, uh, the functioning, uh, pre-production license needs to be sought, which is priced at INR 5 lakh rupees. There's a bank guarantee that an NBFC would need to give to uh, UIDI worth INR 25 lakhs for a 10 year validity. Any entity choosing to implement EKYC needs to uh, interact with the UIDI through an ASA. An ASA is an authentication service agency. As on date, uh, the country has approximately 25 uh, entities uh, operating as ASAs. And uh, if an NBFC implements the KYC, you essentially become a KYC user agency, hence a KUA. Now, different ASAs have priced the um, access to UIDI through them, charging a, a fee of approximately INA 2 lakh rupees uh, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, company, uh, which would uh, vary from ASA to ASA. This is uh, basis our interactions and findings. Uh, there could be some amount of customization that you would require to do with your loan account management system and the vendors that you use to uh, manage your current systems and platforms. Now, we helped the uh, NBFC build a business case and the result of this business was a no-go. So essentially what you see here is the number of loan accounts that the NBFC is sourcing year on year over a three year time period. We recommend that you build at least a three to five year business case to actually assess the outflow on account of EKYC. We plotted all the uh, production, pre-production license cost and the poor transaction cost, which are estimated to be between 25 paise to two rupees, depending on the kind of negotiation you have with the ASA. Some ASAs offer you a flat fee per transaction irrespective of the volume. Some offer you a tiered pricing. Uh, and hence, we, for, for, for assumption purposes, we assumed it at two rupees uh, in this business case here. You also look at some kind of a technology enhancement to your loan management uh, system, uh, audits, periodic audits from UIDAI, uh, deployment of the tablet field devices. We've here assumed a field, uh, tablet field device for about 15,000 rupees and a biometric extension device at about three and a half thousand rupees. Essentially, uh, uh, for, a, for an NBFC of this size, which is uh, uh, bringing in about 100,000 loan accounts in a year, the overall outflow, which was at 12 million INR, 
12 million INR was not a was not a a, a good decision, and uh, hence uh, uh, it 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 did not make the business case viable for them. In case of uh, a small business, also to manage the tablets and biometric devices, which can over a period of time, because they are in the hands of the uh, field uh, officers, lead to high maintenance expenditures. We also understand, uh, and this needs to be studied and assessed. There are certain security mandates recently released by UIDI, indicating the need for installation of HSM, uh, where uh, where uh, customer information is being obtained from UIDI and stored on the uh, systems of the uh, particular KUA. Moving on, uh, uh, we'll also uh, look at uh, integration of India Stack uh, UPI. Uh, essentially, from an NBFC's perspective, today customers, uh, once they've been dispensed the loan amount, are using checks uh, or giving debit mandates or making loan repayments in cash. Uh, we have now here tried to evaluate the situation of moving it to UPI uh, through Beam or uh, through a bank's mobile, a customer's bank's mobile banking app. So what were the considerations uh, to evaluate UPI uh, as a go-no-go -no -go decision for this NDFC? Coming up on our next slide. So the business problem was that the NDFC is currently uh, collecting checks or setting up ACH debit mandates which is time consuming and manual intervention is required for collections in case of uh, uh, unsuccessful uh, check in mandate processing, which means there was, a, uh, there, was there was an incremental cost to handling uh, this cash. Uh, what we essentially evaluated here was two uh, types of uh, UPI based transactions. One is a pull transaction where the NBFC could raise a collect request to their customer for the uh, uh, loan installment. And the second was where uh, the uh, NBFC actually created an environment and awareness with the customer base where the customer could initiate the uh, loan installment payment either in an assisted uh, or in a self-initiated methodology. Again, from a go-no-go no -go decision perspective, we help the NBFC do a technical capability enhancement, uh, look at the commercial aspects, which is the one-time and the recur recurring variable costs, uh, integration with a suitable bank partner to support the enablement of these UPI based payments and uh, thereby, you know, uh, create an enablement within their uh, uh, organization and their customer base of an additional channel for loan installment collection or payment. So what was the outcome of this assessment and uh, what was our recommendation uh, to uh, this NBFC uh, in terms of UPI? As we assessed the business case, we looked at the UPI pull methodology where the NBFC initiated a collect request or the UPI pay method as we call it, where they created awareness and uh, training of their customers and their staff to actually be able to pay in an assisted or in a self-initiated manner. What we understood here was that there is a one-time integration fee that your partner bank may levy on you, again, a function of your negotiation with the partner bank. And there would be, a, because these are person to merchant loan repayment uh, transactions as prescribed by the uh, National Payments Corporation of India, there is approximately a, a fee of 15 rupees, which the uh, merchant's bank may levy uh, to the merchant, again, a function of your negotiation uh, with uh, with with the partner bank. So today, if so today, if as an organization, your loan repayment collections are costing you anything beyond fifteen rupees, then UPI is your uh, uh, go-to product uh, to to solve your uh, loan installment worries. Uh, that that is a simple, plain vanilla business case here uh, uh, from from a UPI perspective. And uh, the recommendation to the NBFC in question was to go ahead and implement the uh, UPI for, uh, for uh, loan installment collections from their customers. So what does a UPI project plan look like? Uh, so essentially uh, for, for an NBFC to make a go no go decision to evaluate what does it take uh, to, to uh, implement the UPI uh, methodology negotiation with banks and you know completing the execution of the agreement and other paperwork making any changes that are required to the loan account management system etc 
the banks are enabling the UPI environment in various methods. There could be some kind of API to API server calls, thereby some amount of development time. A lot of banks are also giving you a web-based application wherein uh, the, the go lifetime uh, could be uh, further shorter. Based on the possible scenarios of push and pull transactions, in this particular case, the NBFC decided to undertake UPI integration on a pilot basis, uh, supporting the push transactions where the customer initiates the make payment. This particular methodology entails a lot of uh, customer awareness and customer training to be able to uh, successfully be able to make these um, uh, payments. Uh, the pilot is further uh, aimed to uh, establish the success of UPI and thereafter study if in an agent or a merchant facilitated environment can further help customers to deposit cash against uh, a loan installment payment at this agent uh, network location, thereby giving them the uh, comfort of being able to operate from uh, the proximity of their business environment because these MSMEs may not have the required time to be able to go and deposit money into their bank accounts in case their um, buyers uh, are, all, uh, are making payments to them in cash. So the next step on this pilot is to look at an agent or a merchant facilitated methodology to um, facilitate loan installment payments. So what are the anticipated results uh, from the UPI integration that we are uh, expecting uh, for this NBFC in question? Uh, one definitely is the digitization of the manual activities pertaining to customers' loan repayments, whether it is collection of checks or processing of cash or even processing the debit mandates. This is also means that the NBFC is giving its customer an added convenience of being able to make 24 by 7 by 365 payments, thereby uh, not really defaulting even if a payment is made later into the day. Creating a starting point to help the MSME or the bottom of the pyramid segment into a digital ecosystem where India is striving to get and uh, enhancing the overall efficiency of the organization in serving its customer. These are the anticipated results from the UPI integration, which this NBFC is clearly uh, aiming to achieve. What we've also got here for you is a broad level project plan as an NBFC on the UPI uh, payment collect and the UPI uh, uh, make payment, which is the customer initiated, just to get a broad idea of what are the steps that you need to have in mind at a macro level when actually uh, envisaging an, uh, a UPI uh, integration. So these are the two project plans, collect payment and make payment. It's a very, very broad level project plan for NBFCs as a reference point to build upon when designing their uh, project plan for implementation of India Stack. Uh, to summarize the key considerations in integration to India Stack are the business aspect to assess what are the components which are required what is uh, the need the, uh, the need assessment and the partner choice from a technology perspective assess what are the technical requirements to suitably integrate to india stack what are the compliance requirements and again the partner choice the right technology partner from an operational aspect uh, existing process assessment existing policy assessment and uh, define the uh, additional aspects of the changes to the processes and policies in light of india stack from a customer service standpoint, customer communication, training of the customer interfacing staff to be able to handle the queries uh, pertaining to India Stack uh, to ensure that in case of customer difficulty in adopting the particular channel, product dissonance doesn't set in. Layering on top of all these assessment is a business case assessment against the business numbers that the NBFC is, uh, is projecting over the next three to five years and the kind of impact that you uh, foresee to bring internally within the organization and to your customer base. These, according to us, are the key considerations in India, uh, in integration into India stack for any uh, NBFC. Uh, but Mona, thank you so much. Um, we've already had several questions roll in. Um, so for those of you that joined a little bit late, um, I just wanted to reiterate that there's two ways that you can ask questions. You can either type your question into the question box that you'll see on the right-hand menu, or by clicking on the hand icon to raise your hand. 
Um, so we can go ahead now and turn to some of the questions that we've received. Um, so Mona, actually one of the first questions that we received pretty early on in the presentation was, um, who are the types of institutions that are working on integrating with India Stack and what exactly are their use cases? Uh, thank you, Priya, uh, for this question. So essentially, the number of institutions which are integrating or looking to integrate with India Stack or have already integrated with India Stack are essentially banks, telcos, NBFCs. Uh, there are a couple of MFIs uh, who are uh, essentially integrating with uh, India Stack. The, the most important or fundamental uh, component which integration has really been successful is EKYC as the numbers also indicated in one of my slides. Great, thanks Mona. Um, and it looks like we have a question from Amy Stewart on the line. So Amy, we're actually gonna unmute you for a second so that you can um, ask a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, that's perfect. Great. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mona. Um, just I'm here from, from Exio and working closely with, with uh, Mona and the team. Um, fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for, for the overview. I did want to return a bit to some of the uh, concerns that you raised in an earlier slide with the news headlines around the, uh, the privacy issues, around having data sets stolen. If you could just comment a bit more on how we as practitioners should be thinking about these concerns and helping uh, financial service providers to, to anticipate and manage these concerns. How much of it is, is really something we should, should be worried about or, or is it um, more secure than we think? Uh, thank you, Amy, for your question. Uh, I think a very pertinent question in today's time. Uh, uh, all organizations uh, have been very cautious uh, in implementing their uh, risk uh, methodologies, processes, risk assessment methodologies and processes. And I think uh, the, the only mitigant is staying ahead, constantly reinventing and uh, being prepared uh, to um, address uh, the, the potential threats, ensuring that all the certifications are done in a timely manner and uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the systems are not exposed to any kind of uh, uh, malicious attacks, uh, being on the watch and uh, being prepared. You cannot uh, obviously uh, ensure that you are uh, uh, totally uh, risk proof, but you can make an effort and that effort is what will uh, count in the long run. Perfect. Um, and Mona, we, so we have two questions from someone on the line, um, Amit Gupta. Um, Amit, I'm going to see if we can get you live. So we're going to unmute you so that you have an opportunity to ask your two questions. Uh, hi, Mona. Uh, am I audible? The connection is a bit weak at my end. Yes, you're audible, Amit, and thank you for uh, great. joining us today. No, Mona, thanks. Uh, great presentation indeed. Uh, so, in fact, first question you have already answered. I was more keen to understand the operational steps for an NBFC to decide on the EKYC. So, I think that you have addressed in subsequent slides. Just on UPI, uh, can can this also be done through feature phone? Because many of our uh, sort of uh, small ML micro enterprise kind of loan clients are in tier three, four kind of cities, and most of them have feature phone. So, what would it entail for them to have a UPI on that? Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Amit, for your question. Uh, the the UPI today is enabled either through the bank's mobile banking app for these 55 banks, as I mentioned in my presentation, who are certified. And the other alternative is using the Beam app. So does that mean that a large set of customers who do not have smartphones and who do not have apps on their devices uh, cannot do uh, payments uh, digitally? Uh, well, uh, uh, while UPI at this point in time cannot be evaluated for them, Amit, what you can definitely evaluate, and maybe I can take this with you offline, uh, a case in point for a particular organization with a set of customers, 
is the usage of uh, the USST uh, to evaluate uh, the loan repayments uh, using feature points. Perfect. Um, thank you, Mona. And then I actually, we received one other question um, just through the chat, but I think a lot of people are interested in hearing about what can other countries learn from India's experience in developing the India stack? Again, a very interesting question, and I thank the audience for this. Uh, India, indeed, is setting an example for the world in the way uh, digitization is happening here. Uh, so any country which can be compared to India in terms of population size, in terms of uh, the kind of problems that we have here in India, be it from being a cash intensive economy to governance issues to hygiene issues uh, and to social problems i think there is a lot to demonstrate uh, a lot we have demonstrated already and a lot more to demonstrate in the uh, demonstrate in the coming times uh, that the the solution to all these problems probably relies in um, uh, probably lies in implementation of uh, digital solutions uh, and uh, uh, digital technology. Uh, for example, um, uh, water, uh, you know, India has a, a large water problem. Uh, water ATMs have been deployed to solve this problem. India had a cash intense um, uh, usage. Uh, UPI is coming to the rescue of the country to lead it to a less cash environment. Uh, the Aadhaar, which is the fulcrum of this entire India stack, is paving the way for e-governance and to bring in uh, transparency in uh, you know in in all the government uh, interactions and engagement with uh, the citizens of the country so i think um, uh, there there is uh, a lot out there already demonstrated so countries facing similar problems to that of india uh, can essentially uh, emulate a lot what we have done in terms of India stack uh, and digital payments. Great, thanks. Um, well, we have a lot of questions coming down the line. <laughs> um, so Laura Gilman had a question. Um, Laura, I think we're going to unmute you so that you have an opportunity to ask that. Uh, yeah, I actually want to uh, hear more about the DigiLocker solution in particular, and I am quite interested in understanding, um, it's very similar to what's been discussed in the application of blockchains, kind of an immutable database that kind of has um, tracks, and that's where contracts and land rights and things are, are being thought about. Is has DigiLock, or In the conversation about DigiLocker, has blockchain been discussed or considered, or what's the more, I guess, technical side of that database um, that makes it unique? So essentially, let me just, uh, Laura, try and answer that question for you because it's a very, uh, uh, a very uh, broad-based question. Uh, to begin with, what DigiLocker is aiming to do here in India is to basically allow entities which are issuing certificates to issue out a certificate digitally to a person. For example, an education board giving a certificate to a student for having completed high school or uh, a particular professional uh, degree. Uh, so this essentially is issued out digitally, which is verified. Now, when this student wants to give this uh, uh, document or the certificate to either a university for pursuing higher education or to a, a potential employer uh, to prove his educational qualifications, simply put, he provides and he gives a a controlled access to this particular uh, um, uh, university or to the employer to validate his uh, his uh, qualifications. Now that's the simplest put application of DigiLocker here in India. Great, thank you, Mona. Um, and we we have one more question from Mohit Saini from Microsave. Um, he asked, going forward, how can fintechs in India leverage India Stack for reaching the last mile? Uh, thank you, Mohit, for your question. Uh, so essentially, uh, India stack uh, is, is essentially for the masses. EKYC uh, is very clearly the first step for uh, MFIs uh, to basically start onboarding their uh, customers using EKYC. What will also mean is that customers will now start seeing the change that is coming into the country uh, not only in metros or uh, the tier one cities, but also within the hinterland. 
that will also bring in a lot of confidence because with with a large set of population already aadhar enrolled now when they see the application of this particular utility the confidence will increase since the mandate of the government and of most of the banks and financial institutions in the country is also to go cashless thereby to ensure that the fraud uh, is reduced customer interests are safeguarded the next bit is upi integration to ensure that people can make payments digitally and electronically this will also encourage people especially if we look at the msme uh, environment at the bottom of the pyramid is to exchange less of cash physically but to essentially transact digitally and ensure that buyers buy from these msmes by making payment into their bank accounts and these msmes take the raw material or supplies from suppliers by making payments digitally now when uh, when when this cycle starts right and the msme also starts making repayment of his loan installment digitally the circle has done one full round and uh, this also essentially means that now uh, the, the the digital revolution that we are all trying to spark uh, has has actually started and the dream of a less cash environment will will not be a distant dream as we probably think it is today perfect thank you mona um we also have a question from about UPI from Murthy um and Murthy I think we're going to unmute you so that you can ask hi good evening all we just want to ask you <clears throat> you said a couple of nbfcs have signed up for UPI what to know which market they are from is it from a metro market or a urban market or a rural market and what are the risk for you? and uh, that's one question and second one is uh, uh, for the pull uh, upa pull uh, payments what are the risks risk involved there because um, typically in a, uh, a microfinance in a rio where the branches are scattered all across uh, right. it is possible that uh, some of the there are employee related risks there where the customers may not be very well informed uh, mm -hmm. so that something that um, okay. have you faced it and are there any risks which has been uh, already which has already been highlighted or addressed so far okay so mr Just muti to address your yeah to address your first question who are the nbfcs who are trying to evaluate uh, upi so these are across uh, the genre that you mentioned there are nbfcs who are operating in uh, uh, various markets uh, but essentially uh, the ones who are keen to uh, uh, deploy upi are the ones who are serving the msme segment where the loan installment uh, amounts are uh, smaller values uh where uh, cash is very intense and uh, uh, debit mandate processing is uh, is uh, uh taking a lot of time because there are uh, unsuccessful uh, fulfillments uh, which happen on uh, debit mandates uh, because the customer's account does not have money they are trying to leverage upi to say that um, uh, now the customer can make payments on the go they're trying to evaluate an agent network where the customer doesn't have money in his account but he can go and deposit cash at this agent network and uh, they are also trying to uh, 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 give customer the comfort that he may have forgotten to go and deposit cash in his bank account uh, uh, during the day and now an agent can help him uh, make the uh, upi payment or if he's got money in his account but he could not do the transaction during the day time for want of uh, uh free time he can now uh, do it when he has free time outside of banking hours and still the loan installment will be uh, duly credited into the nbfc's account uh, so uh, essentially uh, nbfc's serving the msme segment are uh, are evaluating upi to answer your question uh, moving on to your second question what are the risks envisaged in a pull uh, upi so let me just step back a little to just delve very very briefly on what is upi pull you are an nbfc and you have dispensed a, a, a loan to a customer and his loan installment is due let's say on the 10th of november what you essentially do is you collect the vpa the virtual payment uh, address of this particular customer at the time of onboarding and from uh, your system so it is not an individual loan officer who is initiating a pull request 
this is a system generated pull request to the customer's vpa and he is the, the customer when he re receives this request for loan installment payment he essentially receives a pop up in very simple and layman terms is that uh, entity so and so nbfc abc is uh, requesting for a loan amount uh, repayment let's say uh, inr 2200 rupees the customer's account does not get debited instantaneously unless the customer approve this transaction so from an nbfc standpoint uh, it is not an individual staff or a set of people who can raise this request these are raised from the system and nbfc to mitigate any potential risks need to have a maker and a checker uh, in place to be able to raise a collect request uh, uh, from from the the system ensuring that uh, the, uh, the the access is there to select set of people with password protection etc and the second thing is that uh, this money even if it is raised fraudulently uh, by somebody accessing the system it will essentially go into the nbfc's account with the partner bank and not to any other account from the customer's perspective the request is coming from the nbfc systems and it will not get processed unless and until the customer approves the transaction which means that if the customer does have any doubts upon receiving such a request he can reach out to the nbfc's contact center or to the branch manager of the nbfc's nearest branch or to the loan officer to ask that i have received this request and this is a genuine request and can i go ahead and make a payment the third aspect is the upi the way the platform has been created within beam or within the bank's mobile banking app from where you approve this payment transaction the transaction history is there and national payments corporation of india which is the owner of this product has also created suitable uh, 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 mechanism for customers to be able to repudiate their transactions and raise queries if they feel that uh, the transaction was not done by them or was wrongly done great thank you mona um and we have one more question um from leslie around co connectivity so we will unmute you right now. Yes, uh, thanks. And thank you, Mona. This was a great presentation, very informative. Uh, but I, I had a question, given all of the uh, reliance on electronic you know, checks and balances and confirmations, has there been a, an issue with uh, connectivity failing? And has, and if so, you know, what are the implications for clients' trust in the system? Thank you for this question. Very interesting question. Uh, in fact, it brings to my memory, uh, you know, when I was doing this case study for the said NBFC and I was in their office demonstrating to them UPI uh, between my bank, uh, my uh, bank's mobile banking app and my, my counterpart colleague from the NBFC using the Beam app, uh, we, we triggered three transactions and all those three transactions could not be processed. We were in a metro, we were in a hub location with proper network connectivity but the transactions did not fail because of an issue at the bank end or because of UPI as a product or as a platform. These were essentially data related issues. We triggered the transactions after a, a few minutes of time and they went through seamlessly. Is, is, is this the first time that something like this has been experienced by you and me who are probably based out of metros, who have good internet connections uh, and good smartphones? Uh, well, no, this happens to us many times. There is call drop of problem that we face most of the times, and now this is data. Uh, so essentially, the role of the NBFC here would be to initially, during the uh, testing or the pilot phase, uh, do test transactions with customers uh, to ensure that they know that it is working fine. Uh, the second thing is to ensure that the customer contact center and their field officers are acutely aware of what are the network issues within that area where the customer is staying and to build enough faith with the customer saying that if, if a transaction is failing, uh, then they should attempt it in some time and, um, you know, uh, it, it's essentially has got nothing to do with the platform. It essentially is network related. Uh, so I think it is about creating awareness. The collateral that you use to build awareness amongst your customers should also ensure that it, mess it gives out the message that if the transactions have failed at an attempt, uh, customers should not disown the product. They should make an attempt in some time. 
if they still face problem the customer contact center of the nbfc is here to support them and help them uh, so i think this is the key to address this uh, problem and it will happen uh, you know network failures will happen but i think creating awareness adequate training is the way to solve this issue great thank you mona um so we are now at the end of our time um Thank you everyone that was able to join today and thank you for your very thoughtful questions. I definitely learned a lot about India Stack and I hope all of you did as well. Thank you to Mona and Shweta and the rest of the Axion team. Um, and we'd also like to give a very special thank you to City Foundation who made this research and thinking possible. Um, so you can find more about um, City Foundation at www.citygroup.com. Um, slash city slash foundation. So um, and we will send out um, an email with the recording of this webinar um, after this call to, to everyone that registered for this webinar. So thank you all so much. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar and I hope you have a great morning or afternoon or evening wherever you are in the world.